Good morning and welcome back to Y254 in the morning. My name is Faith Msoli. And just in case you're joining us, it's WCW. On this segment, we celebrate the strength of a woman. Now, I'm sure you've come uh, across these three types of people. The one who drinks on a uh, weekend only and the one who drinks on a... Uh, on, uh, one who drinks on a weekend only, sorry. The one who drinks at events only. And the one who drinks from Monday to Monday to an extent that he or she cannot go to work without being drunk. And they even reach a point where they decide to quit work and major into drinking as a career. This people need our help and not ridicule. And today in studio, we are speaking to Brenda Ocheng. She is a reformed alcoholic and an addiction coach. Karibu sana. Wow. So alcoholism is a topic that is so close to my heart because I have relatives and friends who have been, or rather who are alcoholics, and you find that Leo Adamuka will even go to a pulpit and she's, he or she is like, I'm saved and I'm no longer going back there. And then after some two or three days, he still, is, he goes back there and you're like, gosh, is this still the same person when Yalikuwa Kanisani is saying how, is she, how he or she is saved, blah, blah. So it is just so courageous to come out of it and say, like, I'm not going back there. But that is, as, before we reach there, let us know who is Brenda Ocheng and how was life growing up? Brenda Ocheng is a recovering alcoholic, <laughs> grateful recovering alcoholic. Um, currently working as a recovery coach mm -hmm. and I'm also an artist and I like to do my work artistically. Wow. Yeah. So how was life growing up? Life growing up I must say was one that anybody would envy. Mm -hmm. I have the greatest parents who gave us everything that we needed to grow up. Mm -hmm. We grew up in a good neighborhood, Kilalesha, went to good schools like St. George's, Kenya High. Mm -hmm. My dad would drive us to school Mm -hmm. um, all the way and he was working in KIA in Kabet and he would pick us up for lunch and then take us back and then pick us up. Mm -hmm. My parents did everything they could mm -hmm. and they brought us up um, with the fear of God also. Mm -hmm. So I would say that I had a very good childhood mm -hmm. and, and even my teeny, teenage mm -hmm. was, was good. Mm -hmm. I had everything that I needed. Wow. So what did you study in campus? I studied, I've studied so many things, I sometimes forget some of them. Uh -huh. I started off as a banker, mm -hmm. and then I got bored, and then I went on to admin, mm -hmm. because I had languages, and I imagined I'm going to land this weird and wonderful job in UN and make lots of money, and travel, I like traveling. Mm -hmm. And then I decided that's not what I wanted, to sit behind a desk and be somebody's secretary, because that's how many times it ends up when you do at men yeah. and then I ventured into showbiz and I started off as an actor mm -hmm. an actress mm -hmm. I went to Nairobi Theatre Academy and learned how to act how to dance how to do voiceovers and all mm -hmm. of this kind of thing and eventually I made my way into the world of fashion which I have always found very glamorous as a child I always looked at the magazines mm -hmm. Surazuri or Smyrna Fashion Awards all these weird wonderful things mm -hmm. and one day I actually found myself there oh. those are some of the best days of my life I will still say so but that is also where I met vodka mm -hmm. <laughs> okay now this uh, I, this girl who was brought up in church how did you now meet the vodka the vodka was there. <laughs> it, was, it was just there. Like you'd be doing a show like now and over there, there's vodka. Mm -hmm. and, and people would be drinking it. Mm -hmm. I guess they could do that without impunity. Mm -hmm. But for me, once I started, apparently I'm of the kind of people who will eventually, you know, go. I'm not even going to say overboard because my problem is not even that I will drink and then get drunk at work and not be able to drink again. My problem is that I will not get drunk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if I would get drunk, then people would tell me you have a problem. But the thing is, me, I will drink, I will not get drunk, and so I'll think I'm okay. Mm -hmm. And then even when well-meaning people would say, why are you drinking vodka? Now, you know, when you go out and things like that, yeah. I still would love the vodka. Dawas, you know, the ones in Carnival. Mm -hmm. 
people say, why drinking vodka? You're a lady, you know, ladies drink wine and sherry and things. And mm -hmm. I wonder why are you criticizing me? You people are rowdy, you're abusing waiters, you're falling. Mm -hmm. I'm the one who is going to drive you. I'm not drunk, mm -hmm. but I didn't realize that if I can drink that much and not get drunk, mm -hmm. then I have a problem. Yeah, because I'm thinking of like, how high was high for you? <laughs> <laughs> how high? Do you know, I, I don't remember ever being in a situation where people say, hey, you messed last night. So you, you are dancing on the tables and things like that. Mm -hmm. I only somehow made it home and drink some more and then I just black out. Mm -hmm. I'm that kind of person who actually becomes more quiet the more I drink, mm -hmm. you know, because I didn't know this, but it was acting for me as medication. I didn't know this, but already I had depression setting in wow. within me. Wow. And so this thing was actually helping me to cope. Mm -hmm. When I'm down, bring me up. When I'm too hyper or starting to feel I don't like my life or whatever, mm -hmm. it acts as a sedative and brings me down. Mm -hmm. But the thing about alcohol is that when it is done with you, you'll actually be more depressed and more anxious. Wow. And so you said that you once tested alcohol when you're in Mombasa and you didn't like it. So you tested it and you tested lemon. When, it, when did it become lemonade? <laughs> <laughs> it became lemonade when I associated it with glamour because me I like things like shine like cloud these ones mm -hmm. I just like mm -hmm. things that shine so when mm -hmm. I was in showbiz and I'm I'm associating psychologically without realizing it I'm associating vodka with all the glamour that I'm seeing around mm -hmm. then it started to not taste bad in any case I used to mix it with you know sweet things mm -hmm. two things it was doing for me I wouldn't feel the negative effects that I would feel mm -hmm. and the initial kind of yeah high that it gives you that happy feeling and everything mm -hmm. well this is how I like to be mm -hmm. this is how my personality generally is that I'm a happy person mm -hmm. but by then that I was you know going down into other things so vodka was helping me to be me so we say we call it instrumental you know, instru the instrumental stage where yeah. this thing had is now no longer just something on the side that, you know, you're here to dance or you're here to associate, but mm -hmm. now this thing is just a by the way. Mm -hmm. It actually became the thing that helps me even do this. Yeah. Otherwise, I'd be too depressed. I'd feel, I don't, I don't want to go. I don't want to go to that function. I don't want to meet people. I just want to sit in the house by myself. And you say that uh, the alcohol you realize that you are depressed. So what was depressing you that the I alcohol think, was taking away? I think it was just my life. Mm -hmm. First of all, I will say this, mm -hmm. so that I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. Mm -hmm. I will say that some people, and I think I'm one of those people who might have just the predisposition to be depressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to maybe, I don't know, brain chemicals, cortisol or something is too much. and other chemicals, feel-good chemicals are less. Mm. And, and yet my personality is that I like to be happy. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't, I wouldn't even have called it depression in our day. We never used to say such things, eh? mm -hmm. like, use words like depression. But I think that innately I was feeling like I'm not living my purpose. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not happy really with um, my life. I wanted other things for myself. Mm -hmm. um, um, by, by the time this was happening, I was in my late 20s, early 30s. Mm -hmm. Me, according to me, I was supposed to have gotten married at 23. Yeah. <laughs> you know, had finished having my kids by 27. Mm -hmm. In any case, I was supposed to before that have flown all over the world mm -hmm. um, and maybe been a broadcaster. I really wanted to be. I had a cousin who was a broadcaster and I really used to admire what she did. Of course, she had an amazing voice, but mm -hmm. yeah. So the things which I had wanted for myself, I somehow, how somehow would elude me and I never used to know why. Mm -hmm. So every so often it came back to bite me, hey, so-and-so has gotten that. So oh, how come this one has gotten that? And then I'd feel down. So are you trying to say that for one to become an, an addict, alcoholic or a drug addict, are you trying to say that uh, there is always something that is eating him or her and it is not aware. Absolutely. And that something could be emotional mm -hmm. or mental, like you have something as simple as depression, anxiety, or something even more serious like schizophrenia is starting to come in, or bipolar or something like that. When you're taking that drink, you're not taking that drink so that you can become an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. You're taking that drink just to feel normal. You're actually self-medicating. Wow. But there's always an underlying reason. Mm -hmm. And to go back to your initial question, why that person who is praying in church 
is going to go back to alcohol the same day is because the underlying reason has not been dealt with. Wow. So where, where did you reach and you realize that, no, this is too much for me and I have to seek help? It reached for me when I discovered I had TB. First of all, that was so shocking to me because as far as I'm concerned, TB was always something out there, you know? Yeah, because there is always <laughs> this superstition that, or not, not, not superstition, it's okay, it's superstitious in a way that TB is always associated with people with HIV. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And also people living in unsanitary conditions. Yes. So it's shocking to realize I have TB. Mm -hmm. Shocking to realize it was going to cost so much to treat and at that particular time I had just done a bad deal and people had gone away with the money mm -hmm. and so I was in panic and then I'm being told also to you have to stop drinking in order to take the medication because I was then referred to Rhodes Clinic mm -hmm. and then to discover after two days of trying to stop drinking and feeling like I don't know my spirit is going out of me that I can't. Mm -hmm. I can't not drink. Mm -hmm. um, it's killing me, and yet I can't do without it. Mm -hmm. And at that particular time, call it divine intervention, I saw somebody on TV talking about his drinking, and it was kind of, the, set, the patterns were the same as mine. Mm -hmm. And I realized at that moment, I've lost control. I didn't want to call myself an alcoholic, because still, to me, an alcoholic is somebody who sleeps in the ditch. I have never slept in any ditch. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you see that you're better. Me, I'm better. Mm -hmm. So I still couldn't call myself an alcoholic, but I realized, no, 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 no. Um, I've lost control and I need help. So I reached out to him. Mm -hmm. I must say that during all the time that I was in quarantine, I was in quarantine back then, eh? mm -hmm. I couldn't leave the house because the TB was really bad. Mm -hmm. I still drank. I just stopped drinking vodka, but there was wine available in that house. Mm -hmm. The people who were drinking that wine were very controlled drinkers, mm -hmm. but they didn't realize that first of all, I had TB and I shouldn't drink. And second of all, I just shouldn't drink because I was an alcoholic. So I used to drink it. Mm -hmm. I drank wine medica I drank wine and I took TB medication. Wow. So now I was asking for, I don't know, to go crazy. Mm -hmm. And it was slowly starting to happen, I tell you. Mm -hmm. Slowly, slowly I was losing my mind. Mm -hmm. I actually called that period my seven years of madness. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and so you went to rehab. And so eventually, it was a journey, I tell you. Mm -hmm. In my day, people didn't believe in rehab. I didn't even know rehabs existed. Mm -hmm. But when I went to a certain place, um, as I, I, my doctor, my physician, because I, I thought maybe my liver is going, mm -hmm. she told me you need counseling. So mm -hmm. she referred me to a counselor, and that counselor told me about her rehab. So finally, after a long journey, of course, I didn't have money. Mm -hmm. um, nobody I knew would have paid for me because everybody says, ah, see, this one you've just brought for yourself. You just stopped drinking, that's it. But yeah. the drink had taken me. I couldn't just stop drinking. Yeah. So a random German, I'll call him random for now. A mm -hmm. random German is the one who saw the situation mm -hmm. and gave me the money to go to rehab. He's not random anymore because he got married to my sister. Yeah. So I went to rehab in Asumbi. Mm -hmm. And it was the best program I have ever seen. You see now, because of all those things I was saying in the beginning, uh, feeling like I don't belong here, I don't belong there, I can't get what I want. You mm -hmm. know, I've done so many things, so many different, different courses in my life, mm -hmm. which were amazing for work. I remember I did Franklin Covey and my business went, you know, shot, you know, it went really good. Mm -hmm. I did many other things. But this program was especially good for me because it was dealing with my underlying issues from way back, you know. Whereas I had that almost perfect childhood, there's so many things around you and, you know, that happen. And unfortunately, I was a, a very intelligent child. So I would take it in, you mm -hmm. know. People think this is a child, she doesn't know what's happening. Mm -hmm. But I would take it in and I would, I would you know, try to process this and it would uh, cause me, uh, let me just call it, it's, let me just say, it's what was later causing me a lot of neurosis, yeah. So to go back, this program helped me to go back mm -hmm. to the foundation, mm -hmm. you know. Because if you looked at me at that particular time and said, what is causing this lady to drink? She lived in a beautiful apartment in State House. Her mm -hmm. sister loves her. She has a good family. Mm -hmm. She gets jobs like this. I walk out of this one tomorrow. Yeah. I go to the other one. I had some, I mean, I learned skills mostly. So mm -hmm. I'll just jump from, what is her problem? But my problem was not necessarily in the there and you know in the now uh, there and then mm -hmm. the problem was stemming from other things that eat me up from within mm -hmm. and those are the same same things that also put a block on me reaching out to get what I want to get at the time I blamed so many people as to why I couldn't reach my goals why I couldn't live my dream 
Mm -hmm. But I came to realize later that in the But what was this goal and dream, yet you had a good job and you had... Well, this good job is a secretarial or an administrative... Me, I want to go to New York. Oh. Me, I want to be a broadcaster. Me, I want mm -hmm. to be like Faith. Mm -hmm. Me, I want to... Uh, not just New York, I want to travel the world. Mm -hmm. Yes. Me, I want to marry a specific <laughs> kind of person. Mm -hmm. I don't know that he really exists because I haven't found him <laughs> Mm -hmm. I've come to the conclusion he doesn't exist. Yeah. But my mind was just, I think we used to read Mills and Boons yeah. until we just had this So you were just this building person. castles in oh, the yeah. air. That one. Mm -hmm. And you get very frustrated, of course. And mm -hmm. other people, even younger people, just look at you and you know this one. You know? And yeah. then they go their way and then you end up envying them again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you went to rehab. Uh -huh. And then at a, a point you, you relapsed. Mm. So what happened? When I was in rehab, we did the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Mm -hmm. And step four is where you really go deep inside to find those underlying things. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why those things, you have pushed them into your unconscious. Mm -hmm. They're very frightening. They're very shameful. They're very painful. And they, 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 they just bring up emotions that you don't want. That mm -hmm. is why your mind has pushed it into the unconscious. Mm -hmm. Now I'm being asked to bring it to the, uh, to the surface again mm -hmm. because that's the only way my counselors I also are going to be able to help me. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't know what is in my past. Mm -hmm. So I didn't do it. I just pretended to do it. I just flossed over the top. Mm -hmm. In alcoholism, you become very dishonest. Mm -hmm. So I didn't do it. Mm -hmm. So these things, when once I got out of rehab, they came back to bite me. They haven't gone anywhere. Mm -hmm. Just because I've gone to rehab doesn't mean that, oh, magic now, Happens. everything is gone. Yeah. You know, the world is going to be good to me. In fact, if anything, people have just opened more bars. Those people I've hurt are still out there hurting, mm -hmm. waiting for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, I didn't have the skills to cope with it. Wow. So is it uh, at that point when you attempted suicide or was it before? That was before. Mm -hmm. I attempted suicide when I was still in, in the depths of drinking, despair. I hadn't gone to rehab. Mm -hmm. I, was, I had a very good job in an embassy mm -hmm. and... I, but I was depressed. The thing is, I was clinically depressed mm -hmm. and I needed medication. Mm -hmm. And my friends from my place of worship, they even helped me, push me along to a psychiatrist who, gave, who used to give me medication. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, to take that medication, I could not drink. So I preferred to put the medication aside and to drink. Mm -hmm. I mean, drinking was everything. Mm -hmm. So my depression was not being treated. Mm -hmm. And so I was just getting more and more depressed and mm -hmm. And my depression showed me, you're worthless, you have, you're, a, you're a waste of skin, mm -hmm. there's no reason why on this planet, you just need to go. You failed anyway. Mm -hmm. So I tried to commit suicide and I failed at that also because I'm still here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I failed to commit suicide. You know, much later, 11 years later, I met one of the people I was living with because I was living in a hostel. Mm -hmm. And I know that I had escorted these people out and I was alone in this hostel. That was the idea, mm -hmm. that I take all these antihistamines plus vodka, mm -hmm. and then I go to Mpisha I, and die there, not here. Mm -hmm. And these people who I had escorted and had gone in Amatatu for whatever reason came back, and they found me on the ground. Now, 11 years later is when this lady even told me I was convulsing, I was foaming, I was, it was, it, it's really scary to know all of that. Mm -hmm. But to cut a long story short, the next day I was at work, and that was also a rock bottom. I'm at work and I'm supposed to be dead. Maybe God is telling me something, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe so I'm not supposed you, to So were you this type of a person who was, you, you had to drink to go to work? Oh, I had to drink. Mm -hmm. I was a DDO, daily drinking officer, mm -hmm. with a PhD, permanent head damage. <laughs> I had to drink. Even mm -hmm. if you call me and say, Brenda, can we meet up and, and I don't know, go for a walk or something of that, uh, no, my answer is no. Mm -hmm. But if I really have to come, then I have to have something in my system. Mm -hmm. I absolutely had to drink. I would take morning shots. That's why I lost my job at the embassy. They couldn't stand alcohol, it smelled it in my breath. Mm -hmm. Everything about you is so perfect. You're a nice person, you're a good worker, everything. But mm -hmm. why do you reek of alcohol? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'd be so sorry. The next day I won't drink in the morning, but believe you me, I will drink in the evening yeah. or I'll just look for something else which will serve as alcohol, won't, which won't smell as much. Now you start tricks, bananas, garlic, mm -hmm. yeah. And then there is somewhere you mentioned that uh, you, went, you, you went late for a fashion show, I guess, and again you were drunk. 
So <laughs> I'm wondering, like, how would you walk into a fashion show <laughs> drunk? You want to catwalk in stilettos, but you're still drunk. The thing is, I couldn't do nothing without alcohol. Mm -hmm. So under normal circumstances, that alcohol in que question would be on set. So it would be so easy, you know, mm -hmm. to slip it in or whatever, talk nicely to a waiter. Mm -hmm. But now this one, this particular show was all the way in Safari Park and I was living in Kileleshwa. So I took my shots. Mm -hmm. No, I was living in State House. I took mm -hmm. my shots from home. Mm -hmm. So by the time I got there, <laughs> you know, it was the giggling. I was giggling and I was, of course, unsteady and I was giving my, my dresser a hard time. Mm -hmm. So she had to tell the designer, this person is not fit mm -hmm. to walk. I was actually sent home, not even sit aside, go, just, you're an embarrassment, go away. Mm -hmm. So for your parents, how was it for them when you were battling alcoholism and now that you started at a tender age? Mercifully, they never knew about it. Mm -hmm. I wasn't living with them at the time. My sister, my big sister, who I lived with, really protected me mm -hmm. by not telling them or not telling them everything about it. Mm -hmm. But mothers have six senses. My mom always knew something's up. And the fact that I would re refuse to come home and things, yeah. Mm -hmm. So actually, it wasn't, even when I went to rehab, my parents didn't know I had gone to rehab. You know, mm -hmm. I told them, you know, this is going to kill my parents if they knew that me, of all people, I have become an alcoholic and I'm just a mess out there. Mm -hmm. So that was our secret. And then much, much later when um, I think I'd hit my, now the mother of all relapses, after rehab, by the way, after the second rehab, I still drank and hit a really big relapse mm -hmm. and I lost everything and I had to move back home. Mm -hmm. So after I moved back home and then my mom was sitting there one night I mean, she, op she welcomed me with open arms. Eh? Mm -hmm. I was over 40 and I'm moving back home. So mm -hmm. you can imagine they're welcoming you with open arms. But at the same time, there's so many questions. You know, yeah. why are you somebody who is supposed to be so far in life? Mm -hmm. So one day sitting by the fire, you know, gently, she wanted to know really what is going on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in her mind, there are so many things that she had created. So I just told her the whole story. Mm -hmm. And what amazed me is that she was relieved mm -hmm. that it was just alcohol. You know, she had thought of so many other things. Yeah. And I'm like, wow. And she said, look, that, that's something you take to God. Yeah. You know, you are, you are a, a prayerful person. Give this thing to God and, you know, and uh, stay with us here and everything will be okay. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, even in rehab, they will tell you that you will never beat this thing without the help of a higher power, a power greater than you. Mm -hmm. It may be the God of the Bible or it may be the program, but mm -hmm. in any case, it's not me. And I think things are their God. Eh? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yes, we are so conceited and everything. Yeah. So I, I, I woke up one day, I looked around me in my parents' house and I said, I'm in rehab for the third time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now my parents' house is a rehab because um, definitely I'm go I, would, I was going to be controlled very much and being a grown-up and then living in that kind of setup. Mm -hmm. And I told myself, how am I going to make it this time? I've been to rehab twice and mm -hmm. still drank. And despite the fact that I had the determination, mm -hmm. I'm glad I took myself to rehab. So I, I, I remember that my mom told me that I need to take it to God, ask him to help me, and I need to do, finally do what I was told in rehab. Mm -hmm. Because he'll tell me what to do, but I'll always try to do it my own way. Mm -hmm. So do it the way I've been told to do, every single day without fail for 90 days, whatever else my agenda is to be in, in, uh, in a support group meeting. Mm -hmm. So I did that and one day I looked around and I had made 92 days and I couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. I could not believe. There was a time I could, I mean there was a time I couldn't make a week and I had made 92 days. Mm -hmm. And from there, I just followed that same principle to always go to the support group, to always read the Alcoholics Anonymous group, to have a sponsor, to um, help other people. Now that's where it's very important for me to take myself out of myself. Mm -hmm. I help other people. Mm -hmm. And a day at a time, I've done that until last year, I celebrated 12 years of sobriety. Wow. That's so nice. Thank you. And so far, so you're trying to say that uh, alongside the rehabilitation, you also had to bring in the God aspect. Like you had to be prayerful and just follow the rules that you had been taught at the rehab. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And the good thing is that the program says God as you understand God. So I didn't have to leave my God to, 
to do another God mm -hmm. and, and, and really to discover. I was, you know, I have always been religious, mm -hmm. but I came to understand spirituality. And there's a very big difference. Mm -hmm. And spirituality transcends religion. Mm -hmm. And I learned to meditate. You know, I read, me, I read the Bible. I read the Bible, but also to meditate and to listen, because that's when you listen to what God is telling me. Mm -hmm. And that way I formed a closer bond with my God and I could be, I could practice my religion better. Mm -hmm. and, in, and that's even an, another impetus why I'm not going to drink because I'm telling myself, no, listen, now you're an example. Now people are, are, are looking at you. Now I actually want to help another person. Because mm -hmm. in addiction, you're so self-centered. It's just me, 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 me and my drink. Mm -hmm. But now if I really am in sobriety and I really want to help another person and then I do it the way that my religion has taught me to do, it, it's just fortifies and reinforces everything. Mm -hmm. But to try and do it on your own, me as Brenda or another alcoholic on their own, that's where you just keep slipping back, slipping back. Mm -hmm. And you get so frustrated, you don't understand it. This morning, I vowed I wouldn't drink, but here I am. Mm -hmm. Three days later, I don't even know where I am. Mm -hmm. wow. So for this young boy or young girl who is getting into alcoholism and for him it's like I'm getting addicted day by day, what can he or she do? Somebody who thinks they get, please reach out for help. If you think you're slipping into addiction, the day when you're supposed to get help is today. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to give my number. Yes, you will. I will eventually. Yeah. Um, please look for that help today. If you are a young person, one thing I'd like you to know is that your brain develops, doesn't develop fully until you're 25 years old. So if you keep on drinking and drugging, you're just retarding your brain. So stop now. That's not the way to go. It's not cool. Uh, if your friends are telling you smoking bangi is going to help you pass exams, it might, but it eventually it will retard you. You will end up with a, a schizophrenia or another mental disorder. In any case, your brain will be gone. So stop now. Wow. Where can people find you? Are you on social media? I am on social media. Mm -hmm. I'm also associated with a very nice rehab called New Health. Mm -hmm. And... When I'm not doing, you know, when I do my recovery coach things, then usually I'm in the field. Mm -hmm. I'm actually talking to that addict or mm -hmm. helping them in some other way. Mm -hmm. But the ones that need rehabilitation, I take them to a place in Ketisuru called New Health. Mm -hmm. So you can find me there as well. And they're very nice counselors there. What are your social media handles? Um, my name is Atieno Tatien. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nothing brand or change. Atieno Tatien, mm -hmm. Tatien Terraces. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can find me there. Mm -hmm. You can also find me on 07, is this the time yeah. to give me a number? 0722 646 873. That's 0722 646 873. Um, if, you re if you call that number, I would be able to help you. Like I say, I move around a lot. So I'm more likely to go where the addict is. Wow. You have a very beautiful story. Thank you and very much, Faith. I know that there is a boy or a young man, a, a young girl out there who has been inspired by your story this morning. You've touched so many hearts and thank you for coming out because not so many people would want to come out, especially women, would want to come out and say, I've been al an alcoholic before and now I'm reformed. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. You're welcome. Wow, what a beautiful story from Brenda uh, Ocheng. And uh, this morning, as you start your day, I know that you have come across this, that whenever you go online, for example, on Instagram, and all you like looking uh, on Instagram is deco. It reaches a time eventually when the online logarithm realizes that faith likes looking at deco. And so whenever you log on to your phone, that is what keeps popping up. What am I saying? That that is the same way our brains are designed. That whatever you keep thinking of, that is what keeps thinking. That, that is what keeps popping on your mind all the time. You keep thinking of positivity, that's what pops on your mind. You keep thinking of negative things, that is what keeps popping on your mind. Food for thought. Thank you for watching. On behalf of Kayesu, uh, it's goodbye for now. Uh, Val is up next with Bounce Nation.